Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. It is wonderful to be here on the green with all of you today. I am Kalila Brown Dean. I'm host of the radio show and podcast Disrupted for Connecticut Public. And I also now serve as university professor and executive director of the All Britain Center at Wesleyan University. I am excited. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> I am excited today because I get to be in conversation with amazing leaders who are literally on the front lines of social change. Leaders who do what others just talk about or complain about. And I get to be in conversation with leaders who are not content with their own status, but are creating new pathways for positive social change. So it is indeed my honor to help moderate this conversation today. It is important that we are together in this moment, in this space, to have a conversation about the voting age in the United States and lowering that voting age to 16. We are on the cusp of key United States Supreme Court decisions that will determine whether we will actually live the democracy that we proclaim to have. On the green today, we are merely steps away from where an encampment was set up yesterday to draw attention to housing insecurity mm -hmm. in this state. And we are on sacred ground that was originally inhabited by people who for 100 years after their recognition still could not access the ballot. That is what brings us together today. So you didn't come here to hear me. I want you to hear from our amazing guests. I will have them introduce themselves so that they can talk about briefly what they do at Citywide Youth Coalition, and then we'll get into the discussion. So Jamila, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamila Washington. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm an organizer at the Citywide Youth Coalition. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa Marie. I am the director of community organizing for the Citywide Youth Coalition, and my pronouns are she and her. Hey, y'all. My name is Talana Monique Lawson Dickerson. Um, my pronouns are they, she. I am the director of political education at the Citywide Youth Coalition. I think actually maybe let's, let's move into the conversation yeah. <laughs> because that gives us a nice framework for what's happening across the country. I want us to focus on what's happening right here across the state of Connecticut and even locally in yeah. greater New Haven. Timo, Citywide Youth Coalition has been involved in affirming youth voice, not giving a youth voice, but affirming youth voice since its founding. You've been involved in a lot of different areas. Why this focus now for the coalition and all of your partners on lowering the voting age to 16? Mm. I think Alyssa should take this one. Yeah, let's go, Alyssa. Um, so this was a process that took us about a year and a half to decide this is the campaign mm -hmm we wanted to take on. Um, it started with the uh, naming of Dr. Burks as the new superintendent for uh, New Haven Public Schools. And at the time, our membership, which included the two student representatives on the Board of Education, um, were in opposition of Dr. Burks and really wanted to mobilize uh, young people across the city. Um, however, the issue that we faced is that while Citywide was a part of the um, campaign that allowed for two young people to sit on the Board of Education, uh, what we came to find out later is that these two young people, while they get to vote, it was really uh, a wasted vote because their vote did not count. So we started to dig deep with our partners at LOSA and BOLSA, which is uh, two uh, law orgs at um, Yale, and we started to do some heavy research around well, what has to be changed within the city for the vote of these two young people on the Board of Education to count. Mm -hmm. um, and then our membership was like, well, that's not enough, right? Like, it's not enough for just two students to be heard. It is important that all of us as young people across the city are heard in uh, local elections. And we started to reach out to partners across the country who were already leading this work. Um, but essentially for our young people, what we sort of landed on is that 
it is imperative that they are allowed to vote on the things that are impacting them today and mm -hmm. the things that will impact them tomorrow, um, whether it is our city budgets who will in years later find us and our city in debt, whether it is in education, whether it's in policing, um, but it's recognizing that young people are not just the leaders of tomorrow, but if not the leaders of today. Thank you, thank you, Alyssa. You know, I think when I look at what's happening across our city and across the country, mm -hmm. we can't afford to wait for young people to be leaders. We have to get out of the way and allow that leadership to emerge. I'll ask our other two panelists, one of the key things about voting at any age is being educated about the issues mm -hmm. and socialized in a way that helps people see, yes, your voice matters, yes, your vote can matter. What's that piece of civic education that can be coupled with this? So what Alyssa was saying too is, this isn't something that happened overnight. Mm -hmm. We've had two superintendents since that initial conversation. Yeah. It's a journey. How can civics education help in that? Um, I can start. So I know for myself, I started as just a member of Citywide Youth Coalition. So they had um, political education and then they had like dinner and dialogue nights where you would like talk about the things that are going on in your neighborhood or talk about like issues that are going on in your school. So with the political education, I found myself learning things that I didn't know about voting um, and about just electoral stuff in general. So I wanted to like, I wanted to get more involved because I knew like, oh, this is something that I should be fighting for, issues that are going on in my community, but how do I do that? Like, what are the steps that I have to take and what are the things that I have to learn to actually move forward with that? So. Let me ask you a follow-up, Jamila. You talked about that work happening in partnership with Citywide Youth Coalition. Were you getting that kind of exposure and encouragement in your school? Um, I would say that I wasn't getting that type of encouragement in my school. Mm -hmm. my, art, my school was an arts-like focused school, so, and then we did have a civics um, class, but it was like later on that I took it. It wasn't mm -hmm. when I first started um, at Citywide. Thank yeah. you. I think it's very, like education is like my biggest piece, <laughs> right? I think that it's so important when we talk about, if you don't know about like what the issues are, even how the system even works, how can you engage in it? Right. It's very telling that here in the state of Connecticut, you only need 0.5 of a credit to graduate of civics. And it doesn't matter what your job is, what profession you get into, you are impacted by laws. You vote. You should vote. Right. Um, you're impacted by ordinances. So I think that that is something that needs to change. Right. Like we as a society culturally do not educate ourselves on voting or civic engagement or how, how do we engage with um, the folks up in Hartford. Right, like it's the only position I've ever seen in my life where you get hired for a job and your boss does not keep tabs on you. All of us are their bosses. We pay their salaries, we hired them. Why are we not figuring out what they're doing, when they're doing it, how they're doing it, how they're voting? And that's done by design, right? The systems are working in the ways that they are supposed to. So a lot of this work is how do we rebuild these systems, right? And edu the education system is a big piece of that. Right? And so a part of, yes, if we lower the voting age, how, do we, how are we educating folks? That means that we need to put pressure on the schools to then, to your point, create these cultures in these schools and these spaces right? to educate our young people on the, the electoral college. Right? What are our rights? What does the Constitution say? What does the 13th Amendment actually say? Right? We're not educating our, our, our folks on our rights, on all these things, and right, and so if young, and these are things that young people want to know, right? We have some people showing up to Citywide with pocket constitutions, pulling them out when we doing Jeopardy games, right? Because young people, that we have, oh, I'm, I'm gonna stop my rant in a second, but we live in the era of Google, y'all, of TikTok, of YouTube, of Instagram, if they're not getting it in schools, they know what they're missing out. They know the schools are not the place to be educated. That's not real information. We know the truth about Christopher Columbus, right? <laughs> you know, like we know we're learning what real education looks like. And so if we are not actually educating our students in school, they then will not find the value in going to school. Like, it's, it's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, I'll stop y'all, I'm sorry. No, don't stop. <laughs> That's not a rant. That's called passion, and we need more of that in our community. I want to push 
on what you just said. Right? John Hope Franklin says we have an obligation to tell the unvarnished truth. And what my grandfather would say with his sixth grade education is you have to call a thing a thing. Mm -hmm. And so there are choices being made about what is taught, what is not taught, about what is encouraged, what is not encouraged. There are choices being made about who is eligible. And so if we think about the fact that in the United States, there actually is no constitutional right to vote. Mm -hmm. That's intentional, mm -hmm. that's by design. What then do we do in this era where there are people who want to ban books, ban discussions and teachings to get to that point of young people having a choice to say mm -hmm. whether I'm getting it in a classroom or I'm getting it in a youth-led community organization, I am being exposed to ideas that then allows me to see myself as an actor, mm -hmm. not just as a bystander. How do we get there to push toward having more of this conversation? I think for those of us who, I will say New Haven has over 100 nonprofits, mm -hmm. right? And many of us focus specifically on young people, but I think the issue often is with those of us who provide services within the city is we benefit from the problem, right? We benefit from the systems operating the exact same way that they're operating. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll give a shout out here to our executive director, Addis. When I first came on to Citywide, eight years ago, <laughs> the very first thing she told me is we are working to work ourselves as nonprofits out of a job, right? Um, because the day that we do no longer have a job, it means that we have found solutions to the issues within our community. I think it requires those of us as nonprofits to really step into the gap that our schools are often failing. Sometimes the students aren't getting the information at home. It requires us to really build some true people power movements where we are doing some real political education. I mean, we've had young people within our programs come back to us week later after a lesson and be like, like, we just talked about this in class today, and this was not the framing that the class used, and when I challenged the teacher on the information, I was kicked out of class and told that I was being a troublemaker, right? So I think it requires us as nonprofits to really stand in that gap um, and provide the information to our young people so that we are not just providing services in our community and allowing the problem to continue, but that we are building real solutions and uh, uplifting the leadership of our young people today. Mm -hmm. Something I think I'll add also is, I think this is really a call for community, right? There's some intergenerational work that I think is missing in here, mm -hmm. right? Like as a youth organization, and if you look at history, right, like most movements have been powered by the energy of young people, but with the wisdom of our elders, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to come together. And when our young people are saying, hey, mom, dad, community members, X, Y, and Z is happening in the schools, who are the moms, dads, and community members showing up outside the schools to hold the schools accountable? So when our young people are getting this education outside of the schools and in community, because there's a lot of intelligence and intellectual people out here in the streets. Let's be real, education is everywhere. So when our young people are in the schools talking the truth and, and to your point, right, like challenging these systems and trying to walk in their power, right, we need to support them. We don't need to say like, oh, well, well you should have never said that. The teacher's always right. Uh, we as adults need to stop and understand we are not always right. We are human, we are flawed. Like our teachers, and I've, my daughter will tell you, <laughs> our teachers think that they are infallible. All right, and they are not. And we as community members, again, need to hold our teachers accountable. Yes, there is a teachers union, but we are, those are our kids. Those are our babies. We got aunties, uncles out here in community. We need to have an intergenerational moment where if we're gonna be doing this work, in order for this system to change, we need the support of all of the organizations that don't you do youth work to support the youth and what they're doing. We need y'all to understand why lowering the voting age is important, right? And starting that habit at a young age. Because most folks do not start voting until they're in their 30s or until there's an issue when we talk about these like, um, what do they call them, the issue politics, right? Until there's an issue that directly impacts you, you not politicking. We need to always, we black, brown, and poor folk, we always politicking. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question that's gonna seem really basic, but it needs to be asked. 
I'm sure there are some people listening who say, that sounds great, that's nice, right? That's cute, lower the voting age to 16. But can we trust that young people are mature enough or focused enough to do it? And let me tell you why I asked the question. It's summertime, in case y'all didn't know from the weather. <laughs> And I was driving through the city realizing, oh, look at that group of young campers, young kids who are campers. All of their counselors are like 15, 16, 17. Mm -hmm. You go to Lighthouse Park, there's a lifeguard or someone else, they're usually a young person. You go to an amusement park, you get on a roller coaster, you are entrusting your life and yep. safety into the hands of a young person who is that ride operator yep. because they are willing to work for little in order to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways that we literally entrust our life in the hands of young people, but don't trust them to make a decision about voting. What's your response when people say young people aren't mature enough or serious enough to handle voting? You don't know history? Right, I, I think that's the very first thing. You yeah. have not studied history. The reality is that young people uh, through the civil rights era, through uh, Vietnam War, through LGBTQ rights movements, young people have led the way, right? And Absolutely. when I say young people, I'm talking about young people between the ages of 15 to 25 have led the way, right? When we study the Black Panthers, when we study the Young Lords, uh, when we st study the Star Collective in New York City, young people have been at the center. And to be clear to the piece that Timo just uh, mentioned earlier, right, the importance of the elders within this work. But the reality is that even now, as we are looking at what's happening within our state, as we are looking at what's happening across the young people, uh, across the country, young people are still leading. When we talk about the work of uh, police free schools here in our state, and you're looking at the work of the Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union, and you're talking about organizations like Hearing Youth Voices, uh, Race Out of Waterbury, young people are leading and engaging in real political conversations and providing real solutions to the point that these coalitions have passed bills within our state that have completely shifted the way education moves. When we talk about uh, black and brown and uh, studies that passed in 2019, yep. it was young people who was fighting at the forefront, at the Capitol every day, testifying to the point that uh, representatives were like, this is the largest amount of young people we've ever had show up to testify in favor of a bill. So if young people can do that, young people can also show up to the ballots. And also, science tells us, and there's plenty of research out there, papers from UCLA and Harvard and Yale and all these elite institutions, which I have my own issues with data. However, the data is out there that says that young people have the mental capacity to vote. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know I would say that not all young people are the same. Like, you might have a specific group in your head that you're like, okay, I wouldn't really want those young people voting. But we know that that's not true. Like, we're in school, we're getting engaged, we're in these organizations getting civically engaged as well. And it's very important to understand that maybe that's a little bit of like your fear and your anxiety about like a new perspective, like um, the lady had mentioned in the video. Young people are bringing a new perspective to politics, and I think that some older people are very scared of what radical change might happen if they allow young voices to actually be heard and not told to sit down and wait your turn. And to that piece, right, like, to be clear, the change isn't happening to the left or to the right, right, right? because expanding voting rights, and, and it's, a uh, talking point that we've heard a lot of like, you just want more Democrats to vote. And like the reality is, right, that there yeah, is a base of young people who are conservative, there's a base of young people who are uh, Democrats, who are in the center, who are liberals, whatever the case may be. But however, across the board, whatever party young people are uh, subscribing to, there is fresh and new ideas that young people are proposing. We recently heard from a group of young Republicans who are pushing for climate change. Uh, reforms within their parties, right? So there is new ideas coming to the front that I think it is our duty to expand voting rights within our country, especially <clears throat> in a time where voting rights are being challenged yes. across the country. Yeah, And I think kind of, I think a lot of adults kind of get to that point and that's like kind of their only argument is they're not mature enough, right? Um, but to your point, right? Like in every other facet of life, driving, right, 
and everything at the jobs working paying taxes Pay, get paying mm -hmm. taxes like young people when it serves adults young people can do it when it doesn't serve adults they can't do it and i think that's really what it boils down to because when we talk about and that's why it's important for young folks to know their rights no taxation without representation where is your representation because y'all getting taxed right like y'all legally have these rights but yet y'all can't vote like it's it, it is mind-boggling why, why that is even logical and, and allowed, right? Like, and so when we think about, and I think to your point, like naming a thing is naming a thing, like that's what we need to name. We need to name that it's like, it's adults hoarding resources, hoarding power, right? Because to Jamila's point, they're afraid of what these new, new ideas, and, and the reality is most folks in politics got into politics when they were young because of their ideas and their passion for this work. If y'all ever have worked on an election, it is not an old person game, it is not a single mama's game, this is a college student's game, mm -hmm. high school student's game. Like, for real, for real, it is a young person's game when you get into politics. And so they know exactly what they're doing. So the, a couple of things that I wanna point out from what the three of you just said. What I also hear from voters across all ages and young people who want to be able to is a deep-seated sense of frustration that no one is representing their interests, that it's not about Democrats or Republicans, it's about resisting a two-party controlled system that plays to a very small group of people who are often very moneyed group of people who are then able to overlook the challenges that are happening. But I also heard you name the word power. Right? That's what democracy is built on. That's what politics is built on. This is a fear of losing power, especially for people who already feel mm -hmm. like they're not in to begin with, and now if I have to compete with you too, yep. how do I do that? Yeah. How do we address that notion of power that is at the core mm -hmm. of everything that you all have talked about today, but particularly for young people who feel like they are being controlled without having a voice? How does power show up in this debate? I think something we, the minute young people enter Citywide, what we say is our job as organizers is to be disruptors. Our job is to disrupt the way power operates within our city, within our state, whether it's at the Board of Alders, whether it's at the state capitol. It is important that we are building true people power across our communities, whether it's, a uh, I think what it requires is a working class movement where working class folks across the country yep. are truly getting together race aside and everything to build a power and a movement uh, that really challenges the way our systems work, right? And the reality is that black women are leading us when it comes to building working class movements in our country. Black queer folks are leading us when it comes to building working class folks in our country. So it's important that we follow their leadership as well, right? Um, however, I, I think what we've seen is that the minute that young people come anywhere close to threatening the a power of those who are in office, we see stuff like a possible TikTok ban, right? <laughs> For a uh, app where young people are truly learning how exactly are these movements, uh, how, are, how are these institutions are operate, operating, right? I think when we talk about what is happening within our country right now, right, and like, New Haven was one of the grounds for a lot of the uh, Palestinian encampments that were happening across the country, right? And we've seen how quickly institutions began to demonize young people who were starting to challenge the status quo, right? So I think it is important that we continue to push young people to challenge power within our city and also that we are building a trainings and uh, programs within our organizations that are training these young people on how to exactly do that. And kind of to Alyssa's point, when we're talking about working folks, right, working class folks, and specifically here in Connecticut, we like to work in silos, mm -hmm. right? Like I do me and you do you, and I'm gonna hoard resources. That's, all of that's gotta stop, right? Like we have to come together as a people and realize when I, all of us are oppressed until all of us are free, 
right? Like when we're talking about I'm fighting for mine, you're fighting for everyone. So I think we gotta get away from these identity politics and understand that like when I'm fighting for the things that directly impact me, I'm also fighting for you. And showing up in solidarity with folks, right? Um, and the intergenerational things and also creating these silos, right? Like going, sending teachers to a train and it. Like going to a DEI, training for a job or anything, none of that is it. This is a cultural shift. This is cultural change. That means there are growing pains that need to happen. And you have to be willing to do the work. Because to your point, when we talk about like, oh, that's cute, that's nice, y'all over there doing the thing. Like, no, that's gonna take real work. That takes people showing up for other people. That takes people actually taking the time to learn where other people are coming from and maybe needing to sit down and just listen today and I know you're new, used to leading, but you in a new space, right? And I think we see that kind of to Alyssa's point where kind of the old guard of black and brown folks that fought and respectfully fought for the power that they have, but because we have this idea that there's a limited source of power, right? So then when the young folks want to come up, the old guard close. They, they hold on tight. They got because they're afraid of going extinct. We get it. We love y'all. Y'all did the work that y'all did so that we could come up and, and, and grow and be better and y'all floor, y'all ceiling is our floor. That's the purpose of this, right? And so we gotta get to the point where we understand that no, there, we all can share the power, right? And, and we have this idea that, okay, black and brown folk, all right, we fought for the right to vote but we're still not being heard, all right, well, Let's gather together with some young folk and make our voices louder. Go, let, let's go to the, to the, um, the undocumented population. They, those are our brothers and sisters in arms. Let's get together with them and fight for all the same rights. While they're up at Hartford fighting for the right for health care, where are all of us that's fighting for the homeless folks and voting for this? We're all fighting for the same people. We're all fighting for the same things. We are all, all of our, inter we're all connected. Right, so when we fully understand that we're all fighting for the same thing, then we get to that point where no, it's not that we're trying to, we barely got power over here, you trying to take the little bit I got, nah. We're trying to expand it to everyone so all people are equitable here. Yeah. Jamila, let me bring you in because yes, we are fighting for the same things, but the structure of power is that we often end up fighting each other Absolutely. for very little. Absolutely and leaving the real meaningful things on the table, right? So we care about who's at the table, what seat you're in, who got to get there first, and not realizing the real meeting is happening over there aside from the people. What are some ways that you would say that we can build more of that conversation across generations so that we have that shared respect and that I'm talking with you as a young person, not because something bad happened or because somebody has created an image of the Kia boys and that becomes the only way we think about young people. Mm -hmm. What can we do to have more intergenerational conversation so we work together and not against each other? Mm. It's definitely allowing young people to show up as themselves because yeah. someone had said it earlier that a lot of times young people are in the classroom and teachers are going, well, that's not correct. We know the right answer. You don't. It's allowing them to make mistakes because you all were young at one point too and you had to make mistakes and you had to come back in your old age like, okay, you know, maybe I was, maybe I was a little right. So it's allowing them to show up as their full selves and actually make mistakes and be in the political field because a lot of older people don't know what they're talking about either. Let's so saying right like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about is very, it's, it's not allowing them to, it's not giving them space. It's not allowing them to actually be present in the work that we're trying to do in the community that we're trying to create. Um, Timo got into it a little bit about intersectionality. There are young people of all walks of life who you might feel like, oh, why are they talking about this issue? That doesn't really affect them. But it does because we have young people, I have young people in my life who I feel like don't have a right to speak all the time. And I'm like, okay, this is why I do the work that I do because it's very important for me to show up for those who can't show up. Mm -hmm. Let me ask mm -hmm. you this. What are the issues that young people are focusing on and the work that you all are doing that they say, our voice really needs to be heard in these key areas. What are you hearing? And I'll go down the line what you're hearing. 
I don't know, like literally everything. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, are young Police, people. Free schools. Yeah. City budget. Mm-hmm. Homeless folks. Mm-hmm. issues. Like, there's Housing. a lot of teen homelessness. Yeah. yeah. And that's the point. Because a lot of people <laughs> assume that young people are just focused on one thing. Mm-hmm. And what I hear from you is that young people don't have the luxury of being single issue. Mm-hmm. Concern yeah. people. Mm-hmm. Everything affects them. I think what people forget city. is that young people have adults in their lives. Yeah. So when their parents are struggling, and then that's kind of like the difference, right? Like when adults struggle, adults are the ones making the decisions, right? So what we forget about is like if so-and-so is not working, that directly impacts their, their child. That directly impacts the teenagers or their siblings, right? And if they're on state and housing and the young person wants to get their own job and that's gonna directly impact their parent who's on section eight and they wanna move and actually like go and live life now, like that directly impacts. So all of the issues directly impact. And I just wanted to say something that kind of Jamila brought up, right? About like old folks were young folks too, right? But when we talk about like the young folks making mistakes or when the person on the video was talking about, oh, they were drinking and doing drugs and that and the third. Last time I checked, adults get DUIs all the time. Um, adults um, w- do, like, a lot of the things that people say, like, young people are doing, and this is why we can't trust them, adults do the same thing, too. They just don't have somebody yelling at them, tell them they can't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the other piece of it in terms of the, having an adult in your life, there are a lot of young people today who, again, did not have the choice to remain a child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. They were put into adult situations, yeah. making decisions for adults, Absolutely. We have young people who are the translators for their families yep. mm-hmm. and have to navigate yep. all those systems and have that responsibility. Absolutely. So how we also realize how, as a society, we have failed to create a structure and space where young people can just be. <laughs> I want to pull out four key takeaways from what our panelists have said today. Be present, be fierce, fearless, be accountable, and be real. Mm -hmm. Join me in thanking the International Festival of Arts and Ideas for hosting this conversation. Thank y'all. Thank our amazing panelists who are in the grassroots every day. And I want to thank all of you who have been a part of this conversation today. I am Kalila Brown-Dean, host of Disrupted for Connecticut Public. Thank you, everyone. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank y'all.